I imagine that you, as myself, would like to think that we all receive the best possible health care in every situation and that we as humans would just naturally just look out for one another and, and do the best we can to care for one another and provide each other with the best, um, you know, healthiest life that we possibly can. And, and that may be in principle um, what we're shooting for, but we know in reality that that's just not the case, that, that people from different cultures, when they come to this culture or we go to their culture, I mean, we receive different levels of care. Oftentimes we receive different access to care and all kinds of things. And it's not just patients. It's also culture influencing the, the doctors and the, and the, and the healthcare field in general in that culture. So it's, it's, you know, all of these things, um, in which we see the impact and influence of, of culture on healthcare um, that we have as humans. So, um, I want to spend just a minute in this video talking about that intersection, the influence of, of culture on healthcare and some of the challenges that we see in that field specifically related to culture. So let's just start right there. Let's start with some of the cultural challenges that we see in healthcare. Some of the things that, that commonly come up at, from, you know, a cultural perspective in healthcare. Um, we start with language issues. That's, I mean, we're going to talk about two primary categories here, but there's lots of things within those that we can talk about. And Number one is language issues. Um, so, you know, first of all, translation could be an issue. I mean, if you're just, if you're in a country where you don't speak the primary language, if you come to the United States and you speak a different language and your doctor only speaks English, or uh, conversely, if you, well, we traveled out of the country recently and one of my, my concerns was, what if we end up in a hospital and nobody can understand what we're saying? The translation would be an issue. So, I mean, just primarily, are you speaking the same language literally uh, as far as, you know, having that shared uh, language uh, to, to start with, the, the uh, shared primary language? But also then within that, you have language issues with things like medical terminology. I mean, I have become more well-versed in this over time because I have a series of medical issues. So I know more than I did, you know, 20 years ago about the medical terminology. But certainly my, my wife, who's worked in healthcare for a number of years or, you know, has some training in healthcare there, uh, knows all all the stuff, and I don't even understand most of it, so she has to come along a lot of times to translate for me um, to say what the doctor says, even though we speak the same literal language, the same primary language, I oftentimes need somebody to translate what all that terminology means, just um, just, just in general. Um, and then beyond that, you have not only just medical terminology, the, you know, the basic medical terminology, but then within that, you have all this jargon that doctors use. I mean, that. the... the, the and, and not just doctors, but in the healthcare institution, all these abbreviations. And this is true in every institution. Uh, we have it, you know, in, in higher ed as well. But every every uh, career and every um, organization really has these this jargon that you use. So then you, you combine all of that together, and it just can make it really difficult to understand what the doctor's saying or what the instructions are. And, and so... Um, so those are challenges, cultural challenges with language in healthcare. Another cultural challenge we have that's really related to language really centers on um, ethnocentrism. Okay? So um, just this idea that we have differing ways in different cultures of communi communicating about health care. Okay? So, um, for example, um, in cultures that are more um, typically collectivistic cultures and, uh, and have you know, less direct ways of communicating than we do in some of the Western cultures where it's just very abrupt. Somebody asks you how you're feeling, what your pain level is, you're probably going to tell them. And it's, if anything, it's probably going to be higher than it may actually be, relatively speaking. But in collectivistic cultures and, and where, the, where the goal is, like, you know, not to upset the, the fruit card so much, it's, they tend to undermine, under, you know, score lower than these. So they may be feeling an intense amount of pain, but only say that it's at a three. And if you're, you know, somebody from a Western culture who just takes people at face value, when they say it's a three, you believe it's a three. You don't understand that for them, a three really is a seven. Um, so, I mean, it requires that kind of uh, mental gymnastics too, but we have this ethnocentrism in terms of the way that we communicate, the way that we approach healthcare and, and communicating about healthcare and about our own health, um, that, that is just very, very different can, can, can uh, really create some, some significant challenges. Um, and then also language issues related to um, legal issues and, and the laws surrounding healthcare practices and, and the way that we communicate about healthcare. Just starting basically with here in the United States, we have the, we have what we call HIPAA, right, which governs 
patients' rights and, and information, what can and cannot be released to other people and discussed in the open and private information and things like that. So, I mean, there's laws regarding that with language issues. There's laws regarding, you know, just what a patient has to understand and different things. So, um, so understanding kind of the legal ins and outs as well from both sides is, 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 is a challenge, creates a lot of uh, cultural issues and language issues. And those are unique for, for different cultures as well. You go to a different country, they may not have those same kind of uh, rules and the same kind of laws. And so people may not understand what they are here, may not be comfortable talking here because they don't understand that that information is private and, uh, and, and can't be revealed uh, by that doctor without, you know, meeting certain criteria. So uh, lots of different language issues, ranging from just, you know, speaking the same primary language all the way up through this, the challenges of ethnocentrism and, and legal issues and things. So anyway, uh, le language and and, uh, and and verbal communication creates a lot of challenges, cultural challenges in healthcare. One of the other significant uh, challenges in healthcare that is related to culture is what we would define as the historical treatment of cultural groups. Um, different groups have always... Um, you know, have reasons to um, be concerned about or mistrust healthcare systems and, and wonder if they're getting appropriate care and, uh, and having access to appropriate care. You know, and these are not, you know, without rationale or without uh, justification. Uh, but you look at things like, for example, the German SS um, prior to and during World War II did a lot of experimenting on people, primarily um, Jewish people, but also you know, people that they just considered undesirable that were in the concentration camps, they just tested them for, I mean, tested all kinds of stuff out on them, right? Tested a nerve gas out on them, tested uh, on different diseases to see about, you know, both for biological warfare and just, you know, for medical research. But they just, you know, grab people, hey, we need to test this, so we're just going to grab this person. They're, they're not really a person. So it's no wonder that, that you know, that those people may have concerns about, you know, visiting doctors or about the kind of health care that they're getting because they've, um, they're, they're, you know, culturally have historically been treated poorly in, in those situations. Um, another example around that same time frame, Japan's Unit 731. Um, this is a little lesser known um, than like the SS and the concentration camps, but not very different, to be honest. Uh, Japan during that time had what they called Unit 731, which conducted biological warfare and medical testing on Chinese civilians during the 1930s and 1940s. Um, so, again, kind of the same idea. They just didn't see them as real people and uh, didn't have a concern about testing the stuff out on them and, and did so liberally. And uh, really kind of, you know, very, very, very sad, obviously, um, but uh, and, and a tragic part of, of history there. Uh, but we're not, obviously, uh, we're not... Uh, Immune from this in the United States, we're not excused from this in the United States. Um, famously, you know, there, there are a variety of examples we could probably point to, but famously, the uh, Tuskegee Syphilis Project, right? The Tuskegee Syphilis Project, which ran for 40 years, by the way, 40 years, from 1932 to 1972, the uh, the American government was was running um, a test that deceived African American men during that time told them they were, they were doing um, basically tests on bad blood, what they call bad blood, so a variety of things. But what they were really doing is testing active syphilis. They were, they were, they were giving these people syphilis so they could test and see what the um, results of untreated syphilis were. Um, just totally despicable. And, uh, and that happened, again, for 40 years here in the United States, uh, that Tuskegee Syphilis Project was, was going on. And so is it really then any wonder if you look more recently, we fast forward to uh, to the COVID outbreak, COVID pandemic, is it any wonder that African-American uh, people in general, but specifically African-American men, were skeptical about getting the, the vaccination, about the COVID vaccination? Of course, that's not limited to just people of African-American descent. Lots of people were skeptical about that. Um, but, you know, certainly the people who had reason to be concerned about that, you know, if you just look at the Tuskegee Syphilis Project, which is not that long ago, 1972, seems like a long time, it was not that long ago. Those people had concerns, and they had right, had a right to be concerned, had reason to be concerned, because the people of their culture, their ethnicity, had been tested on uh, mercilessly for 40 years. So, um, so it's, it's not really a wonder um, that they had questions about that. Uh, just one other quick example. Currently, we, we, we've seen statistics recently that demonstrate that African-American women are more likely to receive poor treatment um, during their pregnancy. 
and lose more children in, in to childbirth and, and childbirth related uh, incidents and things than um, than people of Caucasian descent. Um, totally inexcusable, and uh, and so is it, you know, is it a wonder that they're seeking out alternative methods uh, of childbirth when they can't trust the hospitals and the doctors a lot of times to give them the care that they need. Um, culturally speaking, that's, that's, I mean, statistics have borne that out. So, so we know that there's reason for a lot of this concern and, and, and the, because of this historical treatment of, of cultural groups that can create challenges though. Again, for example, trying to get, uh, convince African-American men that it was safe to take the vaccine after they'd been tested on for 40 years with the syphilis. I mean, that's totally understandable to me. I can totally understand uh, why that would be the case. So, um, do we have to understand and recognize that that's a cultural challenge in healthcare, though? Is that historically there are groups that have not been treated well yeah, through through the healthcare system, and and so um, have concerns and 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 very real issues about that. For a broader cultural perspective on healthcare, I mean, we talked in another video, previous videos about some of the different types of uh, dimensions, cultural dimensions, um, primarily from, from Hofstede's research and things, things like individualism, collectivism, power distance, time, that kind of thing. And those certainly are at work here in healthcare. We could go through lots of different examples of those things, but uh, but we've spent a lot of time in other videos talking about those dimensions, and I think you can probably draw those conclusions. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those, but I would like to spend a little time on some of the other, uh, maybe uh, ones we haven't discussed as much that maybe have a, a, a specific connection to healthcare as well here. So uh, I'm not going to gloss over these, don't want to gloss over these completely, but uh, but I'm going to focus on a few others that we haven't discussed as much. So, for example, belief systems. Uh, you know, culturally, we have different belief systems, and it comes out through healthcare in one way, in the, in the um, instance of Eastern versus Western medicine, what we broadly define as Eastern medicine and Western medicine. So these are just two different philosophies, two different belief systems about the um, medical uh, about healthcare in general, about how we should be caring for our bodies and 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 the rest of us as well, the rest of our our, our persons. And uh, so, Eastern medicine tends to operate under the what's known as the biophysical model, um, which is, is that uh, in general that disease is a signal um, that the body is out of balance in some way, and that uh, then we want to use natural remedies um, to work with the inherent physiological processes, right? So we want to find a way to get the body back in balance by using some of the things that is provided for us and, and by nature, in nature, right? So we're using these natural remedies to try and bring the body back into balance uh, and, and, and get it back into those natural inherent physiological processes. That's the, you know, again, the biophysical model that, that, that you know, generally speaking, is what we refer to as Eastern medicine, okay? as opposed to Western medicine, which if you're from the United States, it's going to be something that's much more familiar with you or for you. Western medicine is driven by what's known as the biomedical model. Okay. Eastern is biophysical model. Western medicine is the biomedical model, um, which focuses on the scientific understanding of what causes illness. So trying to get to the root cause of those illnesses and understand what is causing those so that then we can use medicine uh, of, of whatever kind, use medicine to kind of fix or correct whatever mechanical, so to speak, issue we're having with the body. Thinking of the body as, as an engine or a machine, this medicine is intended to reset or to fix or to correct whatever issue there is uh, because we then understand the root cause of that illness. That's the idea of the, the biomedical model anyway, that we use in Western medicine. So um, that's what we see uh, frequently here when we go to the doctor. Our, our primary you know, healthcare system is based on that, that system and that model. So there are just different belief systems, though, right? Again, this is not to say that one is better or worse than the other. Both see different results, good results in some ways. And, and it's, so it's not a matter of right or wrong um, that uh, that necessarily we should come to that conclusion. It's just a different approach to how we're doing right? and, and what we're supporting and what we're funding, what we're pursuing. And and uh, so uh, we have this, uh, you know, different belief systems, though, for Eastern and Western medicine. And we're seeing much more of each of these as we um, integrate other cultures into ours. Okay. So again, primarily in the United States, we have this Western medicine, but we're seeing, um, you know, with, with immigration, with, with different people coming here now, uh, from different cultures, we see an influx of Eastern medicine. And, uh, and it's not just this strange thing that you see in movies. Now it's, it's, you know, a lot of people that operate under this biophysical model and, and, 
and um, have a strong belief in that. So we need to recognize that within our healthcare system and understand that there's more than one viewpoint to these things. Uh, another cultural perspective that influences healthcare is this idea of alternative medicine, right? Um, and so alternative medicine is just a general term or a broad term to say whatever other people are doing, whatever, you know, is not normal, so to speak, or not the norm for us. So in our bio, biomedical model, we, we tend to focus on manufactured medications, right, from pharmaceutical companies that are, again, kind of correct or fix whatever's going on. But but so we use these these man-made manufactured um, remedies, these, these uh, medications that come to us. So that's the norm here. But so really anything other than that would be considered an alternative medicine from our perspective. Okay. So we use that term alternative medicine for anything that's not kind of the, the standard or the norm for our system. So alternative medicine includes things like mind body medicine. So the idea here is that the mind influences the body. Things that would fall into this category include things like patient support groups, meditation, prayer, but all of these things indicate that, you know, our mind has some sway, some influence over our body. And we can, we can certainly use that to contribute to our health and, and uh, to, to find that, uh, you know, so to speak, balance between the mind and the body or whatever it is. But our mind influences our body. And so we can use those things like, like sport groups or, or individual meditation, prayer, those types of things uh, as part of a, a medical treatment. Uh, another, uh, in addition to mind-body medicine, we have biologically based practices. Um, these are simply products that are found in nature. So again, thinking about Eastern medicine, they use lots of natural products. So biologically based practices are just products that are found in nature, things like herbal therapies, dietary supplements, uh, even I suppose you could make a case for marijuana right? in a medical sense of uh, being a biologically based practice because it is, you know, it's grown naturally. I mean, there's a naturally grown uh, marijuana. Again, there's also synthetic and those are different things. Uh, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm just talking about, you know, things you things that are grown, things that are found in nature, your biologically based practices are things that are found in nature naturally. Uh, you have body based practices, say so biologically based practices, but now we have body based practices. Here we're talking about things like uh, massage and chiropractic manipulation, or maybe even yoga, uh, depending on again how you're utilizing it and things. But um, body-based practices basically just have to do with using, you know, with adjusting our body and, and maneuvering, manipulating our body in a particular way um, that provides some health benefit or health relief. Uh, and then finally, we have what we call energy medicine, right? So energy medicine includes things like acupuncture, Reiki, um, certain kinds of massage would be considered energy medicine. Um, so uh, just different types of medicine. Um, that's what we, again, alternative medicine is just medicine that's used by, uh, you know, other types of medicine outside of our norm of the manufactured pharmaceuticals that we would normally use. So um, sometimes these are used instead of those, sometimes are used in combination with one another. Um, so um, but just understanding that different cultures will have different perspectives on um, the utility and the value of these alternative medicines. Then finally, we could talk about the social implications of illness, uh, a cultural perspective here on the, on the, the um, social implications of illness, of which there are many. The way that we view these types of, you know, the way that we view health and illness socially and the way that it impacts us from a social standpoint. Um, so we could start with things here. We're talking about things like emotional stigma, right? The stigma of having an illness. It may make you feel isolated or may make you feel like you're worried about not being around other people it may add additional stress there's all kinds of emotional stigma stigma that that comes from uh, an illness that would impact us socially right there's also you know um, we think about the, the the if you remember the case of ryan white which was again something very close to home for me and in my age range um uh, ryan white was a a, a, a young guy, a young man who was diagnosed with AIDS back in the very early days of that era, and um, notably was, was diagnosed, he, he, he contracted um, HIV and then AIDS through a blood transfusion right, when he was young. He had a medical issue and, and contracted it through a blood transfusion, but then a lot of stigma associated with it. He received, a, he was the butt of a lot of jokes um, nationwide, really, and, and I can tell you, somebody who lived in a community near where he was from. And, and um, there was a lot of concern at that time. We didn't really understand HIV and AIDS and there was a lot of concern of, you know, should we basically ship them off somewhere else? 
should we, should we should we have him around? Are we in danger? Are we are we putting ourselves in danger and others in danger by having? But can you imagine the impact that would have on a young boy, <clears throat> somebody who just wants to go to school, somebody who's done nothing wrong? Not that anybody who contracts a disease has done anything wrong, but but somebody who I mean you know is innocent and all this, just wants to go to school, and wants to live his life such as he can, um, but has all this emotional stigma and really impacted his life, his ability to um, to just live life the way he could have and should have. Uh, we also think about the cost associated as a social implication on um, the cost of health care, which can be really burdensome for many, many people, uh, particularly if you're not insured and you have this, these major illnesses or whatever. And that could be a reason that you don't seek treatment, which could just compound the issue. And so, I mean, these costs, when when, when people go bankrupt over over um, not being able to pay their health bills, uh, health care bills, it creates a huge um has huge social implications on the way that people view them, the, the impact on what they're able to do, and the way, you know, again, the way they live their lives. It can have a big impact on your family. When there's an illness, it impacts really the entire family. When somebody's ill or, you know, whether you're elderly or younger, it doesn't matter. It, it really, you know, we are interdependent with these folks. So what happens to one person impacts the rest of us, and um, it can really have a, a strong impact on the family. Uh, so there's social implications there. And then just our community interactions in general. Uh, when you have an illness or when you have a propensity for illness, you, you become oftentimes more isolated. And so you uh, find yourself not able to enjoy the social interaction. We saw this on a, a large scale during the pandemic. We were all very much isolated. And, and it was such a, a relief for many people when they could go back to uh, engaging in their usual activities and things. But uh, for many people, that, that has created even more uh, issues with, with community interaction because they are more susceptible to these things. And, and so it has continued to be an isolating experience for, for those folks even more so um, than maybe some others. So um, just think about, you know, thinking about the community interaction as a social implication. But you know, all these are really cultural perspective, you know, cultural related, culture related issues that uh, will impact uh, health care and somebody's willingness to seek health care and their ability to receive health care and all these different types of things uh, related to that type general area. So there are a few additional uh, considerations when we think about healthcare that I want to that I want to um, throw out here for a minute and uh, and discuss. Um, so uh, uh, one is uh, religion. It's an additional con cultural consideration for a variety of reasons. I and mean, when we think about religion, it could impact the types of treatment you're, you're willing or able to receive. It could affect your views of modesty, your willingness to you know, be seen or, or to, to, to uh, you know, show your body to, to a doctor for whatever reason. You know, there's just modesty may have issues with the, you know, a doctor of the opposite sex um, or dietary restrictions, views on medication and the use of different medications, um, views on the um, uh, the appropriateness of life sustaining therapies. You know, should you put on a ventilator and so forth, blood and organ donation and then death practices. If you were to pass away, what should be done? You know, religions view that differently. So religion has a lot of impact on healthcare considerations. And even, you know, again, we don't like to think about it, but considerations for um, what to do when a person passes and someone dies. What, how do we, how should we handle that most appropriately? So religion will impact all of those things as well. Um, power. It's not, you know, nice to think about, but power has a significant impact on, on healthcare. I've touched on this a little bit, um, but we have inequalities in uh, maybe the you know in the knowledge of different doctors um, that that may be available to certain um, populations, right? So they may or may not be as qualified or have the experience or knowledge of other doctors that may be available to, to you know more wealthy, frankly, um, uh, individuals. So inequalities in access whether or not you have access to the appropriate doctors and the kind of doctors that you need. Uh, hesitance to ask questions or challenge authority, especially if you're from uh, a culture that has a, has a high power distance culture and not accustomed to challenging authority. You may not want to challenge your doctor. If your doctor tells you to do something you're not comfortable doing, you may have trouble expressing that uh, if you're from that kind of culture. So um, maybe an outsized influence of the the outsized influence of insurance providers and government agencies that insert themselves here. Uh, and so um, that's a, a power issue that creates a lot of um, health inequalities as well. And then finally, the power of, of you know ethical power. 
So ethical issues uh, would fall under this category. Things like euthanasia, for example. What, what responsibilities does a healthcare provider have in terms of when it comes to uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia, those types of things, right? So power is a, is a cultural factor here. Information sharing is an important one. Um, there are different types of information sharing, um, different categories uh, of what is and what is not allowed and what is normal, what is what is uh, considered appropriate. Um, here in the United States, we have they, we fall in the category of what we call unmitigated honesty, meaning the doctor it really has a requirement um, to uh, communicate the entire diagnosis to the patient and tell them exactly what's happening, even if it's bad news, even if it's you know, if there's nothing they can do about it, they still have an obligation or requirement to share that with the patient because we that's, you know, again, we're very, um, very direct, very low context um, culture. We're just going to tell it as it is and, and give it to you straight right? um, for better or for worse, again, whether that's good or not. Um, other cultures have different views on that. Uh, they may believe that it's best um, to, to provide misinformation if, uh, if, if they believe it's in the best interest of the patient or they could choose to only communicate part of that diagnosis, right? Or those types of things. So um, in different cultures, that would be the norm. That would be uh, what's permissible, but uh, not in this culture. We need to understand that there are differences in the way that we approach those things as well. And then finally, identity. Um, now we're not talking about identity in the sense of uh, gender necessarily and things like that, which is kind of how this term has come to be, uh, what, what it's come to be associated with. We're really talking here about the communication theory, what's called the communication theory of identity, um, where people make assumptions about each other based on their backgrounds. So we're making assumptions about, other, you know, healthcare providers in this instance are making assumptions about people based on their background. And we do the same about people providing that care. As patients, we do that. Um, there are two concepts related to this. One is called identity salience, which is the uh, the way that people view their cultural identity uh, as an important part of who they are. And then identity intensity, which has to do with the level of importance that people place on that identity. So not only do you, how do you see yourself, but how strongly do you feel about that? Or how, what prominence does that have, that identity have for you? So this may lead to questions about things like, is your doctor from the same culture? And, and, you know, if they're from the same culture, you're more likely to be comfortable with them and, and accept their information, accept their diagnosis. But if they're not, then you may be more skeptical about that, may have questions about that. Or at the very least, do they do they show respect for your cultural identity? If, you're called, if your doctor or healthcare provider is, is from a different culture, do they at least show respect for your cultural identity and uh, instead of just uh, asserting their own and assuming that, that yours is the same and that you will follow theirs. And so, uh, but those are just some additional cultural considerations that we, you know, went through pretty quickly there, but, but some things to think about as it relates to culture and healthcare. Okay. So lots of, lots to think about here as well. This is a huge topic. Culture is an enormous influence on healthcare. Something we ought to be aware of both, again, as patients and as healthcare providers, and it's just as people involved in this healthcare system. That, uh, that we are a multicultural um, um, society in the United States in particular now. We're a multi multicultural society. Not everybody will have the same views on, on health care. We need to acknowledge that and respect the, uh, the um, health care desires of the individual. Uh, but also we have to understand that we are in a particular health care system where, you know, for example, if you're here in a Western culture, then it's going to be easier to follow and find Western medication and, and, and be, and receive treatment in, you know, in, a, in that vein of, of, of medicine than it is through Eastern medicine. That's going to be more of a challenge because it's not the norm here. We've got to recognize that too, that, you know, it's not, not the home field here, so to speak, right? That, uh, um, so uh, we have a lot to think about when it comes to culture and comes to healthcare and the intersection of that, just like we do in, in every other um, part of life, really. I hope this has been helpful for you in understanding the, that intersection of healthcare and culture. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will have a new appreciation for um, the different impacts and the different ways that, that culture does influence and impact uh, the healthcare system he, here and wherever you happen to be.